Let's go back to May 1940. The invasion of France saw some of the first tank-on-tank -tank combat of the Second World War, and the French defenders are using this, the colossal Char B1 Bis, a heavily armed and heavily armoured beast, and one of the most powerful tanks of 1940. The German invaders, on the other hand, are using this, the Panzer III, a smaller, lighter, more manoeuvrable tank. And when these two tanks went against each other, it became apparent that size wasn't everything. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. At first sight, it's absolutely no contest. The Char B1, with its 75mm gun and 47mm anti tank gun, can easily punch a hole through the front of a Panzer III at ranges of up to 500 meters or more, whilst the crew sit behind 60mm of armor. At Stone on the 16th of May 1940, a single B1 BIS commanded by Captain Pierre Bilot destroyed 11 Panzer III's and 2 Panzer IVs, despite being hit 140 times. This is a tank designed to take plenty of punishment whilst also dishing it out. In contrast, the Panzer III is a lot less intimidating. It's got less firepower, less armour protection, but it's a lot more mobile. Germany were forbidden from producing tanks for much of the interwar period. They had a lot of catching up to do before they could put out designs like the Tiger. The Char B1 design dates from the 20s and early 30s, when France feared a repeat of what happened in World War I. They believed the next war would also be one of trenches and stalemate. When we compare First World War tanks like the saint Chamond and even the British infantry tanks, there's quite a few similarities when looking at the Char B1. But when it finally came to the fighting, it became apparent that the Char B1 had been designed for the wrong kind of war, and it was the Germans who had made the correct decisions in terms of their new tank designs and tactics. One of the crucial differences between these two tanks is radio communication. The Panzer III had a Fug 5 radio and intercom, allowing the crew to not only communicate with each other, but with other tanks and up the chain of command. In contrast, the crew of the Char B1 has no intercom, and it was only equipped with an ER-53 radio set, which was limited to Morse code, which was slow to decode if you could understand it at all. The only alternative was these, flags. Less than ideal when you're in the middle of a battlefield. Another advantage of the Panzer III was its crew. Unlike the French tank crews, the German tank crews of 1940 have combat experience from the invasion of Poland. The Panzer III has a crew of five, and I'm positioned in the commander's position at the back of this three-man turret. The commander uses this, the Coppola, to look for targets for the gunner to engage with. And speaking of which, the gunner is located just to the left of the commander. At the front of the tank, you've got the driver, and just parallel is the bow machine gunner who also acts as the radio operator, and just behind him is the loader. And thanks to the radios on board, the crew can work together seamlessly. When a target is spotted, the commander can give the information to the loader and gunner. French tank, eight o'clock, 400 meters, load armor piercing, scene, loaded, fire. Despite being a tank that's just over 80 years old, this is essentially the same as how a crew in a modern main battle tank would operate. But in the archaic Char B1, things are considerably more complicated. It has a crew of four, a driver, loader for the 75 mm gun, radio operator and commander. The 75 mm gun is there to knock out static fortifications, but the driver also acts as the gunner for it, and that's because the gun cannot be traversed, and that means the driver has to shift the entire tank if he wants to aim it. The Char B1 uses an epicyclic transmission, which allows the tank to turn in incredibly small increments. Up in the turret is the 47mm anti-tank gun, and it's a very capable gun at that. It will have no issue smashing a hole through the front of a Panzer III. But there is a few problems. The commander is doing the job of three people. He's not only finding targets to engage with, but he's also firing and loading both the 47mm gun and machine gun. On top of this, he's meant to be commanding the crew, map reading, and looking for targets for his driver slash gunner to engage with. And on top of this, he's trying to communicate with his radio operator as he sends and receives messages by Morse code. It's an absolute sh**. Visibility for the commander was absolutely dreadful, and what that meant was they'd spend a lot of their time sitting here out the back of the hatch, just trying to get a sense of what's going on around them. 
Having acquired a target, he must then duck inside to load the gun and line up the shot through the gun sight, which can be quite disorientating at the best of times. And these are just some of the factors of why when push came to shove, the French Char B1 came up short against the Panzer III. And here is a textbook example of that. On May 14th, 1940, near Flavion in Belgium, tanks of the French 1st DC advanced to meet the German 5th and 7th Panzer divisions, which had crossed the Meuse north of Dinant. The roads were clogged with refugees moving away from the front, and the units were under constant air attack from the Luftwaffe. Progress became agonizingly slow, and then the tanks, which were particularly thirsty, began to run out of fuel. Such was the fuel consumption of the Char B that the French relied on tankers to refuel, and these cumbersome vehicles were stuck in traffic near the rear of the column. The advancing Panzer III's don't have this problem, thanks to this invention, the Wehrmacht Einheitskanister, or what would become known around the world to many as the jerry can. Fuel dumps had been established to allow these less thirsty vehicles to refuel without the need to wait for tankers and they don't have to wait their turn on the pump and can refuel simultaneously. A tank without fuel can't maneuver, and a tank that can't maneuver can't fight, no matter how good it is. That's why they say amateurs talk strategy and professionals talk logistics. So at 0800 hours on the 15th of May, when the two forces collided, the French tanks were still refueling. This meant that just 26 tanks were available to take on the German force of about 250 tanks, supported by motorized infantry, artillery, and aircraft. The Char Bs fought hard, destroying several of the lead German tanks, whose crews were alarmed to see their 37mm rounds having little to no impact on the stubborn French armor, other than scratching the paint. Gradually, though, the German combined arms approach and superior numbers take their toll. The Panzers can maneuver and use their mobility to their advantage, firing and moving whilst coordinating fire from 88mm flak and 105mm artillery guns over one kilometre away. One Char B1, Amiens, survives over 20 hits before losing a track, and a number of others keep fighting even whilst immobilised, but eventually the tanks are overwhelmed and are either disabled or destroyed. In this tank versus tank, we've seen that it isn't always the tank that has the most impressive stats that comes out on top. And to say that the Germans had superior tanks in 1940 simply isn't true either. This episode is a useful lesson in how strategy, logistics, and battlefield experience can provide a huge advantage in any battlefield encounter. The Tank Museum's Panzer III is an OSF L and was captured in North Africa in 1942. It's got a bigger main gun, and it's also got thicker armor compared to the Panzer III's that were used in France two years prior. If you'd like to find out more about this particular tank, do consider checking out our full-length tank chat. The Tank Museum's Char B1 was captured by the Germans and spent most of World War II on the Channel Island of Jersey. And if you'd like to find out more information about this tank, do consider looking at our other videos where you can see inside it. What tank versus tank would you like me to cover in the future? Let us know in the comments below. Consider subscribing and thank you so much for watching.